This morning we're continuing our series on songs of summer. Uh, we're going to be looking at the song, Lord, Rain in Me, the first song we sang this morning. I want to start with a little story, though, that came out uh, a couple weeks ago with a Canadian sailor who just made it all the way around the world. His name is Bert Terhart. There he is on his, on his sailing boat. His goal was to be the first North American to circumnavigate the world on a non-stop journey via the five great capes without electronic navigational equipment. Whew. Okay, I think if you like give enough criteria to anything, it can become a world record. But anyway, it's still a very impressive accomplishment. It took, him, um, it took him since last October. So you can imagine, he thought when he got on that sailing ship, he thought, man, my life's going to be different for the next eight or nine months. And he was really looking, looking forward to getting back to normality when he got home in July. And the first thing he said when he got off the boat was, so what did I miss? Yeah, it's been a crazy few months. But even more odd to me is the fact that while he was out sailing, much of the time he was thousands of miles away from civilization. There were times he came close to land or came towards ports, but for the most part there were times where he was, there was nobody else that he knew of within thousands of miles, except a handful of people that kept coming within 250 miles from him, over and over, multiple times a day throughout his trip. And it's a little bit odd to think about the fact, but that small group of astronauts on the International Space Station was actually the closest people to him for much of his trip. The International Space Station is only about 250 miles above the Earth's surface and it orbits 16 times a day. So over and over, there they were in their ship going by. And it was something on his mind a lot because he was navigating via the stars. And so he, he commented on that when he got off the boat, that that was the closest people. And I think, wow, that's, that's interesting to think about. There he was, out in the middle of nowhere, and the astronauts were the closest people to him. What seems so far away, the space station there is actually closer to us than, say, Italy. If you start thinking about it, it's, it's not so far. And so this morning we sang the song, Lord, Reign in Me. The song says, Over all the earth you reign on high. And, and it started making me think about, you know, we think about God up there in the heavens. Now, is God literally in the heavens? Well, yes, because God's everywhere. God is omnipresent. So God is present everywhere, but it's not like he is sitting up in the heavens somewhere or sitting on some cloud. But we've long thought of God in this way as up high, and it's kind of a reminder to me that even as we think about up there, he's really not that far away, even if he was up there. He's always close to us. He's always near us. Even as, as Bert was circumnavigating the globe, God was near. And it's a really important thing for us to understand because very often in the past there was a, a, a tendency to put God so high up that there was a disconnect, that we could never approach Him. Now God is so high above us, but God also came to earth and was born of the Virgin Mary and walked among us. And so while He is high above, He is also near us. And this song captures this in a way because it talks about Lord reigning on high and also reigning in me. And, and to some extent, our journey of faith, there's, there's a lot of trying to, to hold all of what God is in our minds and it's too much. How he can be so high above us and holy and perfect and yet in us and down in the dirt dealing with the things we deal with. And so this song to some extent captures that. But I want to look at three key things from the song today. I want to look at number one, why does it say God reigns on high? Number two, why did the author choose the word again? Why not just Lord reign in me? Why reign in me again? And then the third question, what does God reigning in me actually mean? So let's pray, and then I'll read the first verse of the song, and we'll look at some scripture to go along with this as well. God, again, we thank you for the lyricists, the musicians, the, um, the poets, the writers who have given us all kinds of different ways for us to help, help us to worship you in word and in music and in song. Help us to, to flesh out our understanding of you. Help us to reflect 
These songs that often they, they get stuck in our heads as I've been preparing this sermon. The, the words go through my head over and over. And, and this can be extremely beneficial to keep our minds focused on you as a tune plays in our head. At the same time, it can be a, a, a negative thing if the song isn't accurate or if we don't really understand what it's saying about you. So we pray this morning as we look at this song, Lord Reign in Me, that you would help us to have more clarity on what it means for you to reign in us and, and for us to just have a greater appreciation for the song, uh, but also for us to be able to just, just to connect with you in, in new ways. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first verse of the song, Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Now, this idea of God reigning on high, well, throughout the ages, again, it's always been seen that, the, that either God or even in other religions, the gods were somehow up above us, up in the heavens. This goes all the way back to Genesis. We see the, the idea of building the Tower of Babel. They wanted to build a tower to the heavens. I believe it was an affront against God. It doesn't explain the tower in the Bible, but from our archaeological evidence, our best guess is they were building a ziggurat. And a ziggurat was a building that they would build in kind of a... They have a staircase going or leading up to the top, and at the top it was, it was understood they would put a gateway to heaven. They might even paint it blue, and the idea was that they were reaching the heavens. And so when the people building the Tower of Babel were doing this, they were basically saying, we don't need God anymore. At least that's how I understand what was happening there. So, so there we see that this idea of them trying to get to the heavens. And it goes on in Genesis and it says that God came down to see the tower. He mocks it if you read that in Genesis. It's almost like he's laughing at them. This tower they thought would reach to the heavens, God couldn't even see it from heaven. Now that doesn't mean that God actually is in heaven and can't see what's going on. But he was adjusting to their viewpoint saying, look, you can't build a tower high enough to reach me. It doesn't work like that. But through, through many other ages, you think about all the false idols in Solomon's time. It says that people, they put the idols, they raised up poles and places of worship in the high places. So this, this idea of being on high makes, makes sense throughout time for whatever reason. Biblically, we also see that God meets Moses on a mountain. God meets Abraham on a mountain. We think about the Ten Commandments and there with Moses on Mount Sinai when Abraham goes to offer up Isaac God is meeting them on mountains. Also rulers they often ruled from high cities. They would find a place that would be fortified. If you ever think about uh, when Jerusalem it says that people go up to Jerusalem. Now why would the Bible say that people are going up to Jerusalem? Is Jerusalem north from everywhere? No. It's because it's a higher elevation. Now there's valleys around it. When you go to Israel and you go over to the Mount of Olives, you go across the valley and, and you're on another high spot. But it was built on a high spot. And there where the Temple Mound, or now the Dome on the Rock, this is the high spot there in Jerusalem. When David sent his soldiers out to fight the Ammonites, they fought at the Ammonite fortress. This is it. That's the citadel in Ammon, Jordan today. But it was there that they were fortified 3,000 years ago. Now these structures here aren't from 3,000 years ago. You can see a little bit of the fortress, but I believe if I'm oriented right, it's back down this way. It's not in the picture. But it was on that, that raised area. That was where their city was. So rulers, they'd build cities on a hill and they'd be fortified. You think about the Greeks who put the Acropolis, or the Acropolis is the name for the high raised area. They put the Parthenon and other temples there in the high area. And so there's always been this idea of ruling from on high. It gives you a view. You can see over your people, over the areas that you rule. When Moses was, was going to, before he died, when he left the children of Israel and Joshua's leadership, God takes him up on a mountain to look over the land that they would be able to rule over. So there's a number of different ideas here. 
There's always been, as I said, a sense of, of God residing in the heavens, God being on high, um, God being above us. The idea of ruling from on high uh, makes sense to many of us just because we've always heard this idea. But I think it's also important for us to understand that as God reigns on high, it's this idea of Him that He has come from above or beyond our realm of existence and understanding. Right? So it's a bit of metaphor like we talked about last week. His ideas are above our ideas. Not physically, but they're greater than. And so he comes from on high. He rules on high. But then it goes on to say that my only aim, right, my desire is that you reign in me again. And so the reigning in me, the reigning in you, is him reigning in a local way. Not removed. Not deistic. The idea of being of deistic is that some people believe God created everything and then he left. He got bored with us. Or he doesn't really care that much. Now, it's not a crazy thought. The idea comes up in the Bible. Right? We read in the Psalms, like, who is man that you are mindful of him? There's a humility on our part to think, why would God care about us? He's so much greater than us, he could see us like ants. But the whole point is he does. And that's the great hope of, of the gospel, is the fact that he cares so much he gave his only begotten son. That's not supposed to be common sense. We're not supposed to read that and go, well, of course, we're great. Why wouldn't he do that? The point is that we're supposed to stand in awe and say, wait a minute, why would he care enough with everything we've done? I mean, there's, there's times that, that we as people look around at the, the ridiculous things that go on in our world, the evil that goes on, and we think, why even make an effort? This place is just too far gone. But God continues to make an effort. And, and so this, this idea of Him coming down on our level is radical. This is something that other gods just didn't do. This wasn't what people thought naturally. They always thought the gods are so far off. And to get their attention, when Elijah is there and he's, he's battling the prophets of Baal, they can't get Baal's attention because he doesn't exist. But they're trying and they start cutting themselves. They're doing whatever they can to try to get the attention of the gods. Because they, they think that Baal is so far off. But see, the idea with, with the one true God is that we exist in His presence. Everything is in His presence. So although He is on high, He is also in and through and around, above, beneath us. We can't escape Him. Jonah tried. There's no getting away from Him. And so God, while He is ruling everywhere, He gives us some choice if we want Him to rule in our own hearts. But He never stops. This idea of God reigning me again, well, he doesn't stop. He doesn't go on vacation. He doesn't take a break. So the reign in me again must be an effort on the author of the song to say, I need to come back to God. We never stop needing God's intervention in our life. We never get to a point where we say, okay, I've got it all figured out. I've arrived. We are just as much in need of a Savior today as the day you met Jesus. Your problems may be different, your sin, your temptations, your struggles, but we continue to need His intervention, interaction in our lives. So He never stops. We know that He's not going to stop. He, he has been making an effort since day one. So the idea of reigning in me again is because we have agency. Now, some people will call this free will. When we get into the word of will, theologically it gets a little bit, a little bit more difficult and complicated. Because when we start defining the idea of being able to will things, it means we can make things happen with our will. And we don't have that ability. Only God can will things. God can say, let there be light, and there is light. I mean, I say things like, you know, tell my kid to load the dishwasher and it doesn't happen. So, I can't will things the way God can. But if God says it, it happens. So God has true free will. His will is completely free. There's nothing that bars it. The laws of physics, the laws of the universe, your wants and desires, none of that affects if God wills something, it happens. And we don't have that kind of free will, which is how some will define it. But we do have agency. We have choice. We have the ability to make choices that God has left within His will. He has willed it to you to have agency. He doesn't have to give you a choice. He could force you to do things. He can, he can kill you on the spot. He could make you stop doing what you're doing. He can make a donkey stop and start talking to a prophet. So clearly, 
God can do whatever he wants. But he, in his will, chooses to give you some freedom, some agency, some choice. A few verses I want to look at here starts with Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. In Ephesians chapter 4, I want to read, starting in verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. This verse 30 here, where it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. If we look at it in context, it seems that we grieve the Holy Spirit by not living the life that we're called to live. In another place, we're told to live lives worthy of the calling we have received. In the last year, there's been a lot of drama with the royal family in the UK with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle leaving the royal family, saying they're not royal anymore, but nobody can get that through their heads because he's always going to be Prince Harry to people. And, and, and that's just become such an interesting conundrum that has captivated a lot of people's attention from when, just a couple of years ago, they were the rising stars in the royal family. But we can only imagine the pressure that's felt by somebody like Harry, born into that family, that he's supposed to live a life according to his birth. According to what his father, his grandmother, the queen expects of him, his brother, the future king. There's a lot of expectations. I'm not here to make a, any kind of statement on whether Harry should or shouldn't be royal or what they should do in their lives. My point is, a lot of us, we don't know what that's like the way that, say, he does. To be born into a family with great expectations, where when you're born, there's already, to some extent, a plan for your life. <laughs> there's already a career laid out. It's quite odd. I think about Prince Charles, the next king of England, potentially, um, if he outlives his mother, which, who knows? If that, I'm not sure she's ever going to die. But think about him. He's been waiting for like 70 years for his life to get started, for his career to get started. He's done lots of stuff. He does lots of charity and, and, and other things. But his main role has been to be prepared to be king. And 70 years in, he's still waiting for that shot. My point in saying that is, in the same way, we have a calling, a royal calling on our lives. But we don't always think about that. But God has given us a calling, an expectation, a bar that He has put before us as His ambassadors, that He expects us to live according to that calling. And so we're encouraged to live a life that's worthy of the calling we've received, that makes Him proud as the King of Kings, as one of His, his royal family members. We don't want to bring shame on His name. There's some people that identify as Christians, and I really wish they wouldn't, because they're using the name of Christ. You know, it's christ Christian. It's what Christian is. And you think, oh, sometimes I just wish they wouldn't tell people, because I think they're, making, they're not making Christ look good in the way they're living. But all of us have that issue, that we, may, we don't want to bring shame on Him. And so we also, we may not have been born into a royal family on this earth, or maybe some of you were, but we are born into, we reborn into the royal family of heaven. And there's an expectation, and it seems in the context here, grieving the Holy Spirit is not living in accordance with the way that we have been called to live. And so the fact that we are given encouragement in this means that we have agency, we have a choice. We can choose to live or not live the way that God has called us. If we go back to Genesis 4, from the very beginning, we see that there was agency or choice given to humanity. The sad story in Genesis chapter 4 is the story of Cain and Abel. We read in verse 3, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. So what exactly is happening here? It's hard for us to know. I think it has something to do with the attitude of Cain's heart because it says he did not have regard for Cain first and then it says his offering. I don't think it was an issue with the offering necessarily unless God gave some instructions we don't know about and he just didn't listen. 
But we know that there are grain offerings in the Bible. God doesn't mind the, the first fruit. I mean, the Pharisees, they were tithing of, of spices. So the idea of giving an offering from whatever you have is, is biblical later on. It would seem that there's some issue with Cain and with how he's approaching God. But he's quite upset that Abel is getting favor from God and he's not. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? See right there, God is saying it was your choice. Whatever he did, he didn't do well. He says, look, if you'll do well, I'll accept you. So there's no sense here that God says, Sorry, Cain, I just really like Abel and I don't like you. Or I created Abel and I wanted him to be great and be glorified, but you I created to be cursed. We don't see that. We see God lovingly reaching out to Cain and saying, Hey, hey, why are you getting upset? I honored your brother because he did well. If you do well, I'll honor you too. He had agency. And God goes on and says, And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It's desirous for you, but you must rule over it. So he's saying, Cain, you have a role to play in this. Your sinful flesh wants to take you down a dark road. But if you do well, we can keep it at bay. But if you don't, it's going to consume you alive. It's going to take you down and it's like, it's like a slippery slope. It's going to take you to places you never want to go. Well, Cain of course didn't do well. He speaks to his brother Abel in verse 9. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then God gets angry at Cain for murdering his brother. God doesn't say, well, you had no choice. I created you to be a murderer. But no, there was personal responsibility here. So we have agency. And so when we hear in this song, reign in me again, the idea is not that God stops. It's not that we have to plead to God. And this is really important because in a lot of false religions, there's this idea that you've got to do enough to get God's attention. You've got to do enough good to please Him. You've got to get Him to, to, to pay attention through all these different things. And God says, no, I, I want to be here for you. I want to spend time with you. It's you that's left me. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus illustrates this in a powerful way. We won't read this whole passage. And you know the story. But in Matthew chapter 11... I'm sorry, we're not to that story yet. We have uh, one, one more thought about agency here. Matthew 11, verses 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, in case you're not familiar with the word yoke, it's... This here that's on these oxen that ties them together. Sometimes you'd have one that was stronger than the other one. Uh, if you're training a new oxen to work, you would yoke him up with one that knew how to pull the cart so that he would learn from the, from the older, mature, stronger oxen. Ox. So in the same way, Jesus here is saying, he's comparing himself like an ox, but that he is the mature one. He's the one that knows how to pull the cart. And so you take the young one, the new one that doesn't know what it's doing, and yoke it to the mature one, and it learns, because it's forced to, to how to, to do the work that it's called to do. And so in this metaphor, Jesus is saying that he is that mature ox, and we are like the young ox. He knows that we don't understand right away. Just because you're born again or know Jesus, it doesn't mean you're a mature Christian, you've got it all figured out. It's a lifelong journey. And that journey isn't simply about learning the Bible or about having theoretical knowledge. It's about living it out. It's about walking with Jesus day by day. And as we do that, when we pull the wrong way, he pulls us back. When we go too fast, he slows us down. When we go too slow, he pulls us forward. This is the, the picture, the visual that he is giving us. But what I love in this passage is, unlike these oxen who are forced by their master to be yoked together, Jesus gives an invitation. He says, look, if you're feeling heavy laden, if you feel like it's too hard, I'll help you pull your burdens. It doesn't necessarily eliminate them. It doesn't mean all life is easy. But it's a whole lot easier when you've got somebody else helping you pull those burdens along. And he says, yoke up to me. But he doesn't say, I'm going to force my yoke on you. It's a choice. 
It's a choice to take it. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He'll, he'll make it a much easier burden to bear. But again, we have agency, we have choice. And so often, so the idea here that we can compare reigning in me is like being tied to that other ox. When we are tied to the other ox and we humbly submit to his leading, to him telling us to go faster or slower or left or right, then he's reigning in us. But when we say, you know what, I'm tired of this yoke and we take it off and we walk away, then he's not. Because he's given us a choice. And it's not a one-time choice. Yes, it's a choice to put our trust in Christ. But it's a daily choice to follow him. It's a moment by moment. We have times, opportunities all throughout the day to follow or not follow Christ's lead. Romans 12 talks about offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Well, living sacrifices, they don't just stay on the altar by themselves. You've got to keep them there. So if you're offering yourself as a living sacrifice, you've got to always stay on the altar. It's a daily, constant choice. One more illustration, Luke 15. This is the one we won't read the whole thing. Um, but it gives us illustration. He never stopped reigning. He was always reigning on high, and he never stopped wanting to reign in you. But we walk away from him. Luke chapter 15, 11 through 32 is a story of the, the parable of the prodigal son. And so you, you know the story. The son wants his inheritance now. He says, I don't want to keep staying here with my dad. I want to be on my own. He takes his money, goes off to a foreign land, and he spends it like crazy, ends up working for slop, for the food that the pigs are eating, just trying to, to not die of starvation. And then it says in verse 17, but when he came to himself, in other words, I came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now there's more to the story but I want to just read that part because it shows that he never stopped. He never stopped being the father to his son who was far off. He was waiting for him. He wanted him to come back. And so there that father is. He is reigning in his own area, the land that he rules over. Right? He's got servants and he's got a family. He must have some land and animals and probably some crops. Whatever he has is his little area there. He never stopped being the, the master of that area, having the wealth and the, the servants. And his son never stops being his son, but his son stepped away from the blessings, away from the influence, the input, to do his own thing. But when he comes back... The father is ready to receive him. As a matter of fact, it says he runs to him. And in that culture, men don't run. They don't go running after their son like that. So it is a very powerful, at Jesus' time when he told this story, it was even more powerful. It wasn't simply the gracious father who would say, well, I'll forgive you. It was a father running. I mean, for the Pharisees and others hearing the story, to hear God betrayed like this, that God would run to us? This is counterintuitive. No, we're supposed to run to him and beg for mercy and hope that maybe he'll find mercy on us. And Jesus says, no, no, he's running to you. He's eager. So when the idea of, will, will he reign in me again? Well, he never stopped wanting to. So the answer is yes. The answer when we have that prayer and that song, this is a song of, of repentance. The prodigal son recognized, he came to his senses and realized, what have I done? I don't deserve to be called his son. Well, that's true. He was not living a life worthy of his father's name. Worthy of the calling that he had in his life. But when he went back to his father, his father was quick to take him back in. Quick to put him, to, to identify with him again. He hadn't lost value in his father's eyes. It doesn't mean his father approved of everything he had done. And it doesn't mean there was no, no consequences. He dealt with a lot of pain in the process, the prodigal son. And as far as we know, although he's able to enjoy his father's house, he had already gotten his inheritance and wasted it. So when his father dies, his brother will get everything. So there are actual consequences to his life. But 
doesn't mean that his father's not there to do everything that he can to restore him and to bring him back into the fold. All right, the last couple of, of verse and chorus here. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams in my darkest hour. Because you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign in me again. Reign in me in my darkest hour. What is a dark hour? Obviously, again, it, it's metaphorical. It doesn't mean just an hour, but it's that time of darkness. This could mean different things to us. This could be when, when circumstances are dark, when there's a global pandemic, or when there's war. It could be when we are dark, when we are feeling depressed, lonely, hopeless, frustrated, stressed. It, it could mean that we're being tempted in our dark hour, the time that we're struggling against temptation. We think about when David wrote how he's with me, right? In the valley of the shadow of death. So he's with us in our darkest times. Whatever that dark time is, we're, we're calling him to still reign in me at that time. When, when, when the world is awry and we are struggling to not fear, we want him to reign in us so we won't have fear. When we are feeling depressed or stressed or anxious or hopeless, we want him to reign in us so that our hope comes from within and from him, not from our circumstances. When we're tempted, we want him to reign in us to give us his power so that we can withstand temptation and not give in to the flesh and to the enemy. And so the idea here in this song is it's not simply about God reigning in us in the good times. It's not just about when everything's going great. Because then it can be a lot easier to follow God. It's when things get really rough. When we need Him to still reign in us. We are more apt to push God off the throne when things are bad than when things are good. It's easier to say, well, I just got to take care of this. We have all this faith and we pray and trust God. And when everything's going great, it's easy. But when things start to go badly, then it's easy for us to want to take the, take the wheel, if you will. Take the steering wheel. Martin Luther King Jr. said, The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of convenience and comfort, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. So in those dark times when we have challenge and controversy we're dealing with, that's when we really need him to reign in us. When, when we have that tendency to perhaps argue or speak ill words to our neighbor, to our colleague, our family member, that wouldn't glorify God, that wouldn't make Christ look good. In those times of darkness, when we, when we want to stand up for ourselves, fight back, when we're being slapped on the cheek, those are the times we really need Him to reign in us. We have to depend on Him so that we don't react in our own fleshly tendencies. The song goes on, and over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Because you mean more to me than any earthly thing, so won't you reign in me again. So things that he wants God to reign over. Dreams, thoughts, words, things. The idea is that God should be more to us than any of this. But this is a good test for ourselves to pray about. Do you allow God to reign in you even when you're just dreaming about the future? What about in your thought life? The words can be tough. The tongue is hard to master. What about when it comes to things? Are we allowing God to reign in us and impact us in all of these things? You see, when God is reigning in you, it will have an impact outside of you. So God reigning inside you will have an impact outside you. We can't say that, that we allow God to reign in us, but there's no outward evidence. If we are truly allowing God to, to reign in us, then there will be things that we can tell a difference in our lives. In Matthew chapter 15, we have the verse, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. It was Jesus speaking. You see, what comes into us, it's about what happens as it comes out of us. That's when we see the evidence of God's work in someone's life. You remember that, that we read Jesus saying that the Pharisees, right, they would strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. You ever wonder what that meant? 
Perhaps you're familiar with, with what they actually did in straining out gnats, but if not, let me tell you. They would filter their wine and they would run it through some kind of a cloth filter to make sure that any kind of gnats or small bugs were filtered out of it. So they'd strain out a gnat. Not because it's so gross to eat a gnat. Now, I, I think it's gross and I wouldn't want to swallow a bug, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was that they didn't want to break any of the laws of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament did not allow you to eat gnats. Right? Not eating unclean animals. There were lots of rules about what kind of things you could eat. You couldn't eat pigs. You couldn't eat shellfish. There's lots of things you're not allowed to eat in the Old Testament. So if they accidentally swallowed a gnat, they would be breaking the Old Testament law. So they were so careful that they would, before they would drink their wine, because you know, if it's sitting out in a jug, something might have gotten in there, they'd pour it through this filter to make sure any gnats were filtered out so they didn't break the law. Now, it's not a bad thing. It's good they weren't wanting to break the law, and it's good that their wine was a little bit filtered. But then he goes on to say they would swallow a camel. And it's, it's humorous, it's a joke, but Jesus is making a point. They're so afraid of swallowing this gnat because they don't want to break the law, but yet they'll do all sorts of other things that go against God's intention. They forget how to be merciful and loving and kind to their neighbor. Right? That they're, they're, they were racist against the Samaritans. So there are all these big things. So Jesus wasn't saying they shouldn't worry about eating gnats. It was great that they strained out the gnat. The point was they were so careful with the tiniest of things and they were totally blind to these big other issues. And so while they were trying to make sure what went into them was not unclean, what was coming out was unclean. How they were treating others was unclean. This is why John the Baptist called them whitewashed tombs. They're clean on the inside, but it was just death. And so if we have God reigning in us, it's about what comes out of us. We see the evidence in how we handle our dreams, our things, other people, our neighbors, our thoughts, how we speak to people. All of that will be affected. We can't divorce our spiritual inward life and our spiritual outward life. They are one and the same. And if there's not a connection, then we have to question what's really going into us. Do we really have the Spirit in us if we're not seeing the impact outside of us? The last little bit of the, the song I want to pick up on is he mentions that he wants the, his life to reflect the beauty of my Lord. How does your life reflect the Lord's beauty? I also recognize that for some of you, you may not like this line because maybe you don't really want to be beautiful. I know Kurt would like to be beautiful, but some of the other guys in here may not like that line. But here the idea is, I, I kind of wish they'd use something like the word glory. This is one of the issues. Some of our songs, they'll, they'll have such a, a feminine aspect to them. Sometimes it doesn't connect with, with some of the men. Because you think about this, and I sing that song, and I think, do I want to reflect beauty? That seems a little bit weird. But when we think about the beauty we see in the sunset, or the beauty we see in the mountains, we see that, that God has all kinds of beautiful creation. But in our, own, in our own lives, if you don't like the word beauty, then again, I would substitute it with the word glory. We want to reflect God's glory, God's greatness. Does your life reflect the greatness of God, the awesomeness of God? When people look at your life, do they see God's greatness? Do they go, wow, I can see God's really been at work in you? Do they say, I, I can see that you're different because you walk with the Lord? Because He's been reigning in you? Are they seeing the impact from that? If not, then that's something we need to pray about and think through. Because again, if he's at work in you, then we should, it should be evident out of you. So last slide for today. If you allow God to reign in you, then he will reign through you and his glory will be evident to all. Let's pray as the music team comes back up for a song of response. God, we thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us. The Bible says, even when we are unfaithful, you are faithful. And so, God, we know that if we cry out for you to reign in us again, and this can be a daily prayer, that every day we find that we wander from you. We try to do things on our own. We, we ignore your teaching. We, we may strain out a gnat in one area, but swallow a camel in another. 
But so God, we just pray that you would help us to be people who are able to cry out time and time again to reign in us, to come back and take on that yoke again every time we, we want to take it off, to realize that it's easier when we walk with you than trying to pull our burdens on our own. God, we thank you that you care enough that uh, while you reign on high, you also reign around us, below us, above us, and even in us and through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.